Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 3.44, A Retrospective Review of the Colonial Era. Here we are, 108 episodes into this podcast, and we have reached a critical junction in our story. Following today, our story is going to begin marching in a direction decidedly towards the revolution. The fourth season of this podcast is going to take the colonies through the revolution and is going to leave us sitting in a different world on the other side. However, before we embark on that journey, I have a few things that I would like to do first. First, looking forward to our next episode, we are going to be having that Q&A episode. I've collected questions and have been working for a few weeks now at answering them and getting it all put together, so that should be a pretty fun time. The episode will both celebrate the fact that I've been doing this for over 100 episodes now, plus the time just felt right. That, however, is for next time. For today, I want to spend our time reflecting on the journey that we have taken so far. I do not mean this to be some overarching review. That's not the point here at all. Rather, the purpose of this episode is to look at those critical themes. Those themes that are going to help us next season when we find ourselves trying to make sense of the events as the relationship between the colonists and the British break down. Next season is absolutely going to see us begin marching towards the revolution. However, is this a march that we've been on the entire time? I've spent 107 episodes telling the story of the colonial history of the United States. And to what end? What has it all meant? How do the first settlements at Jamestown and Plymouth, the rise of Massachusetts, wars with the Indians, wars with the other European powers in North America, Bacon's Rebellion, King Philip's War, the Dominion of New England and its eventual collapse, economic growth, slavery, all of it, explain the position of the colonies a decade and a half before declaring their independence from the British Empire? To do this, I want to focus on three key areas today. First, I'm going to look at the long-term consequences of the original settlements and how it would lay the groundwork for future events. Second, we are going to move towards the expansion and growth of the colonies. This portion will specifically look at not only how the colonies had grown, but also examine the relationship between the individual colonies. We are going to wrap up today then by looking at the relationship between the colonists and the British. Moving into next season, there really will not be a topic more at the core of our story than this relationship. So, before we move forward, let's take a look back and see what we can take away from it all. So much of the future politics of the United States can be seen early on during the founding. And really, the founding presents us with two stories of the history of the United States. In the South, you had the founding at Jamestown, Virginia. This was not done because of fear of persecution, tyranny, or any kind of perceived despotism. Virginia was founded with a singular goal in mind, making money. Those coming over had dreams of being the next Cortez and stumbling along massive amounts of golden riches. We know in hindsight that they never found those riches, at least not in the form of precious metals. In fact, what they really found was a whole lot of sickness and death. Virginia had been advertised as a paradise, overflowing with riches. However, following the 1622 attack on the colony, the Virginia Company could not really sell that anymore. By this point, it was abundantly clear that life in Virginia was dangerous and, as often as not, it was deadly. As a result, the Virginia Company marketing team shifted their focus. They began selling the colony as a place that was still filled with riches but one that is going to require hard work to extract them. To the north in New England, where settlements appear first in Plymouth and then in Massachusetts, we see a completely different ethos. And really, we get ourselves to what the United States continues to hold itself to be. Described as being a city on the hill, the first New England colonies were founded with their guiding principle being religious freedom. It has become the popular story that the colonies were founded by people fleeing from religious persecution back in England. Except, we know that's only part of the story. 
the pilgrims had been Puritan separatists living in the Netherlands, specifically in Leiden, for years. They wanted to cross the Atlantic as they feared an erosion of their beliefs and practices as the younger generation married the local Dutch women. A decade later, when the Great Puritan Migration happened, it was the Puritans fleeing persecution from William Laud under the rule of Charles I. However, they never came seeking religious freedom. What both the Pilgrims and the Bay Company Puritans wanted was not religious freedom per se, but rather religious isolation. We see this clearly in the original Massachusetts Bay Company Charter, where the only way into the government was through the Puritan Church. Likewise, we see what happens to those who fall out of line with colonial doctrinal practices. Anne Hutchinson and Roger Williams were exiled for their views. During the early 1660s, a group of Quakers were outright executed for their beliefs. So, the New England Puritans were never really looking for religious freedom, but rather the freedom to practice their very specific religion. Just in these two places alone, however, we see so many future trends that will help define the United States. Let's look first at who exactly was coming over. In the South, you had a mix of two types of people. You had the wealthy, often second sons of lords back in England, and you had the urban poor being brought over largely as indentured servants. Though you would begin to have slaves appear in 1619, it is going to take a while before we see slavery really catch on. English policy at the same time was to settle people on rather large parcels of land, with the idea being that they would be able to claim more territory that way. When tobacco took over as the dominant cash crop, these large holdings would provide the perfect place to grow it. Tobacco, being a very labor-intensive crop, required a lot of manpower to grow and harvest. Because there was more wealth amongst the top end of Virginia society, you had a population that could afford the indentured servants and later slaves to cultivate the tobacco. Contrast this to what we see in New England. Most of the Puritans coming over from England could pay for the trip themselves. However, it meant coming over with very little in the way of personal property. Upon arrival, the communities that formed were not based on large-scale farming operations like in the South. The money really was not there to hold large numbers of indentured servants or slaves. Not that those two practices did not exist, because there certainly were both in Massachusetts. However, it would never become as indelibly linked to the northern economy as it did down in the south. The northern colonies did profit from the use of slavery. However, whereas in the south that economic link was a direct benefit from slave labor, slaves actually work in the land, in the north the benefit often came economically for helping provide supplies, food, and the shipping to maintain slavery. Now, to be clear, everything that I've just said here is a generalization. There were indeed slaves in every colony. Though, while there was slavery in all of the colonies, it existed in different forms that would really help explain how it develops. The southern colonies had more of a need for actual physical labor. They had labor-intensive crops, which were maintained through the use of slave labor. Northern colonies, such as throughout New England and New York, had slavery. However, the forms were different. The slaves in New York, for example, would have taken on a role more akin to a domestic servant than somebody down in Virginia who was working in the fields. In a crowded city like New York, there was not room for separate slave quarters, meaning that often the slaves would sleep in the same house as the owner with that universal truth that most slave owners were at least a little worried about the slave murdering them in their sleep, it helped place a limit on just how many slaves an individual would want to hold. More pragmatically, you needed somewhere for the slaves to sleep, they were expensive, and how many domestic servants did any single family actually need? The result of this is that slavery was still a part of life everywhere in the colonies, though it existed in different forms depending on where a person lived. Rather than the large plantation-style holdings that we see in the South, 
what we see in New England were smaller subsistence farms for the individual family. Excess from those farms was sold for a small amount of profit on the side. In this society, you could end up having far more of an influx of skilled artisan labor. There would never be a New England cash crop, at least not in the same way that tobacco would reign supreme for the first century and a half of Virginia life. This would have long-lasting effects on the development of the future United States. Right away, you can see the different economic systems being put into place literally from the moment of the founding. These distinctions are going to have profound effects on the future of American politics. Of course, there is more to the colonies than just Massachusetts and Virginia. What we see develop is a strong sense of regionalism throughout all of the colonies. Throughout this show, at least thus far, we have not talked a lot about South Carolina and Massachusetts interacting. However, at the same time, I've regularly used terms like the New England colonies, the Chesapeake colonies, the Middle colonies. This is because so much of what is going on is happening on a more regional scale, rather than more widely throughout all of the colonies. This sense of regionalism, and really so much of the American colonial experience, revolves around religion. Religion has been, in so many ways, at the very core of our story. Down in the south in the Chesapeake, you have mostly Anglican populations. Now, while this is true, there is one, kind of, exception to the rule. I am speaking specifically of Maryland. Maryland was not an Anglican colony, as their proprietor was looking to create a Catholic haven. Well, Baltimore may have wanted to create something analogous to Puritan New England, but for Catholics, This never really pans out for him. The problem for Baltimore is that he was missing one of the key requirements for a Catholic colony. Chiefly, he was lacking Catholics. What therefore emerges in Maryland is a system where the chief proprietor and the leadership made up an exceptionally small sliver of the population. When the Glorious Revolution came along, the Maryland colonists wasted little time in kicking Baltimore to the curb. With William III looking to do away with proprietary governments, and considering that Baltimore, like James II, was a Catholic, he had few complaints about the colonists deciding that Lord Baltimore needed to go. Maryland, however, stands as something of an outlier in the aspect that Baltimore himself was in a very small minority. What is far more common was situations like we see in New England with the Puritans, or the Quakers in Pennsylvania. In those examples, the colony's existence was directly related to religious considerations. We have already detailed New England in this episode, but Pennsylvania was in a similar boat. William Penn had viewed Pennsylvania as something of a refuge from the religious persecution that he and his fellow Quakers had faced in England, and likewise elsewhere throughout the colonies. In both places, religion would help drive those colonies and would play a huge role and how they would develop. In Massachusetts, the Puritans dominated the political scene. Prior to the dissolution of the Massachusetts Colonial Charter in 1686, the path into colonial politics was through the church. The Puritan church was the ultimate gatekeeper over who had a voice and who was frozen out. Despite holding complete political dominance, the Puritans were not the only group within Massachusetts. There was a mixture of other groups who were keen to see that Puritan dominance broken up. When the Bay Company Charter was invalidated, this group, who was comprised of everybody who was not a member of the Puritan faction, would become known as the Moderates. They welcomed Edmund Andros with open arms as he took over the newly formed Dominion of New England. Andros would prove to be an absolute disaster. However, Through this catastrophe for New England, it would help break up that Puritan hegemony. Because Andros was so universally reviled, it would help push the moderates and the Puritans into the same camp of agreeing that Andros needed to go. It was through this that the complete Puritan dominance over Massachusetts was finally broken, because really, there was no going back. In Pennsylvania, 
Quaker dominance would last largely up until the French and Indian War. This would prove to have real consequences in Pennsylvania, especially in matters of colonial defense. The pacifist Quakers were always skittish when it came to military matters. We see them, however, bend some in order to achieve a greater political end. A clear example of this comes during King William's War, when London was demanding more troops, or alternatively money, be sent for the colonial defense. Then Lieutenant Governor William Markham was eager to fulfill his quotas back to London and avoid the ire of the crown. The Quakers in the Assembly, who had been trying to increase their own power for years, used this as political leverage. The result was that Markham got his money, and the Assembly greatly increased their own power through the frame of government of 1696. Years later, during the French and Indian War, it was Quaker pacifism that would end up driving them out of the colony's political scene almost entirely. Dismayed by the direction of the war and the compromises that were being forced upon them, the Quakers largely removed themselves from the colonial government. They would then quickly slot themselves into a role of mediators between the colony and the Indian tribes that the British found themselves fighting along the frontiers. Religion, therefore, is something that is at the very core of our story. Religion was one of the primary motivators and driving forces of events that we have witnessed thus far. So much of our story has revolved around religious questions, and, in fact, several of the colonies were founded to be religious havens. Now, of course, to the extent that this was successful is altogether another question. However, it is undeniable that religion has played a crucial role in defining the path our colonies have taken thus far. Among the most interesting parts of the story of the colonial era, and one that we've spent a lot of time on, especially during Season 3 discussing, is the huge amounts of growth that had occurred over the past century and a half. From 105 original colonists coming in 1607 to Jamestown, to a population of over 2 million by the American Revolution, the colonies had completely transformed the Atlantic coast of North America. I want to look at a few specific examples of the growth, as this really is one of the key factors that is going to help explain just how the colonies would come to have any realistic hope of emerging in a war with the British Empire. Beyond just spouting numbers off at you guys, because honestly, we've already done that, I want to look at the meaningful effect of the growth politically and examine just how all of this is going to play into how the colonies interact with Britain itself. Finally, I want to take a moment to look at how this growth affected the internal functioning of the colonies. We know that there was a dramatic population expansion, especially during the first half of the 18th century. However, even well before the dawn of the 18th century, this growth would help tell the story of colonial politics. These effects will not just be limited to those coming over from Europe either, but also to the Native American population and then further down the road to the slave population. These relationships and the effect from them is not only going to have a huge effect on the colonial era, but it's going to have an effect on everything that comes after it. When those first colonists landed in Jamestown, Little did they know that they were planting themselves right in the middle of one of the most densely populated regions along the Atlantic coast. The Powhatan Confederacy was several tribes that were tied together under the leadership of Powhatan. This confederacy was a complex political group, and Powhatan viewed the English colonists as a group that he could use to his advantage against his rivals. Powhatan quickly became aware that the English had some serious food deficiencies something which he was happy to exploit. By providing the settlers with extra food, Powhatan had given himself what he viewed as a twofold advantage. First, it brought him safety from the English, as it would at least seem pretty unlikely that they would want to attack the guy who was supplementing their food supply. Second, should Powhatan decide that he is tired of all the English and that it just was not going his way, well, then he could just cut them off entirely and allow nature to take its course. 
as it would turn out. Powhatan indeed did grow tired of the English, and he would cut their food supply off entirely, causing the colony to nearly starve to death. Where Powhatan seems to have seriously miscalculated, however, is that he failed to understand the ability of the English to replenish their own numbers. No matter how many of them would starve to death or died from drinking the foul brackish water in Jamestown, more English just kept coming over and taking their spots. And really, this just keeps happening for years and years. The English were dropping at an alarming rate in Virginia, but then more colonists would come over and just take their place, and slowly, everything would begin to stabilize. Of course, they would never find the riches that they had all so desperately sought, but eventually John Rolfe discovered that tobacco grows well in Virginia, and just like that, the colony had a cash crop. Following the death of Powhatan, it was his brother Opashenkano who took over. Now, unlike his brother, Opashenkano was not terribly interested in trying to play the diplomacy game with the English settlers, and indeed struck out at their frontier in a brutal assault that killed 350 colonists, or roughly one-third of the total population. Though devastating in the moment, this would in reality give the English what they desperately wanted. They now had justification that they needed to push outwards, eliminate the Confederacy, and expand their own frontier. This is exactly what they did, and indeed by the time we have reached the middle of the 1640s, the Powhatan Confederacy is effectively dead. The English would continue to push their borders outward in the coming decades. Native American tribes, being shoved further and further inland by growing colonial frontiers, would harass the frontier colonists, though they were seldom able to stop the expansion. As we moved into the 1660s and the 1670s, the narrative would evolve and become one of anger towards the leadership in Jamestown, with a specific ire towards William Berkeley for failing to respond to the very real dangers that existed along the Virginia frontiers. After a botched response by Berkeley, as well as some gross financial mismanagement for good measure, Nathaniel Bacon would take matters into his own hands. This, of course, would expand from just dealing with the Indians harassing the frontier, to removing William Berkeley from power, and then having some fever dreams about greater Chesapeake independence. At the end of the day, however, Bacon's Rebellion, a war that started because of Indian affairs, would come to completely change the state of politics in Virginia. Yeah, Berkeley was gone, but that was just the surface of the changes. What followed was a deeply unpopular English occupation of the colony. This occupation helped unite the former enemies in both the small tenant planting class and the large landowner class in their hatred for that English occupation. In New England, the story is much of the same. After landing in Plymouth, rather than near the mouth of the Hudson, we see the pilgrims quickly form a relationship with Massasoit, the leader of the Wampanoag tribe. As with Powhatan, Massasoit used the pilgrims to his own advantage. Unlike Powhatan, however, Massasoit was not standing on top of some great confederacy. In fact, he was arguably not the strongest chief in the region. He, however, viewed the English as a way that he could solidify and expand his own hold on power. The result of this is that both the Wampanoag and the Pilgrims found themselves tied to each other, as the other tribes quickly learned to keep their distance from both groups. This would, on one hand, lead to a rather prolonged period of peace for both the Pilgrims and New England in general. The Pequot War would take place during the 1630s, but really, between the first New England settlements and the 1670s, there was a relative peace. When those relations finally did break down, however, and King Philip's War broke out, it would come with a devastating price for everybody involved. For the Indians fighting the war, the result, regardless of what side they chose, often led to deportation and being sold into slavery. For some, the result was death. For the colonists, this war was likewise an absolute catastrophe. We can sit here and discuss the loss of life, 
burned villages and farms, and the economic destruction, because all of those things, they all happened. And I highlighted them at the time. But it is the psychological scars that this war would leave behind that would help explain so much of what we would see come in the next several decades. In fact, what we see here, as well as down in Virginia, are two clear examples where the colonists' response over Indian affairs would bring real consequences to the relationship between not only the colonists and the Indians, but between the colonists and the English government back in London. If we are putting a tally mark in the wins and losses column of history, King Philip's War was a win for the colonists. However, this was despite the very best attempts of the colonial leadership to make it otherwise. The war had been horribly conducted. The English more than once found themselves on the wrong side of an ambush. Other times it was the heavy-handed policies and demands of the colonists that would take the other neutral tribes and force them to choose sides. And much to the chagrin of the English, often they allied themselves with Philip. Really, the event that would most shorten the war had little to do with the English at all, but rather is because Edmund Andros was able to get the Mohawk to agree to attack Philip when they made their camp in northern New York. When the dust was settling and the war was over, the colonists were forced to look back on what had just happened. Did they look at their incompetent leadership or the complete lack of diplomatic grace? Of course not. Instead, they looked at what happened and decided that it was because the colony had strayed too far from God. This helps explain the mindset of the Puritans in New England as they moved into the final quarter of the 17th century. As in Virginia, we also see a war that started over Indian affairs become a seminal moment in the history of that colony. Despite its brutality, the result of King Philip's War was one that got the frontier pushed well out. During the 17th century, we see an underlying danger throughout all of the colonies of Indian raids along the frontier. While this was already subsiding some prior to the 1670s, after that, we can really see how far the frontier had been pushed off to the west. Sure, there were still problems if you were living up in Maine or even the northern portions of Massachusetts. However, if you were settling down in Boston, you were pretty insulated from the risk of Indian attacks. The same goes in Virginia as well. Jamestown and later Williamsburg were not in any great danger from Indian raids. This is a trend that will continue to develop throughout the 18th century as the frontiers would stabilize before getting pushed off to the west again. When we get to the French and Indian War, one of the primary causes is going to come from the British colonists pouring into the Ohio country. When the war begins, you see a dramatic uptick in frontier assaults, which causes something of a humanitarian crisis as colonists rushed east to the relative safety of the more coastal communities. The point remains, though, that depending on where you lived, by the time that we are approaching the revolution, it is entirely possible that somebody living in the colonies lives hundreds of miles from any native tribes. At the end of this season, we spent a significant amount of time discussing Indian affairs at the end of the French and Indian War. The war certainly had a major impact on how the British and the Indians viewed each other. We saw, time and time again, land deals that were incredibly suspect. While questionable dealings with the Indian tribes is nothing new, a series of deals made in the run-up to the French and Indian War, specifically the walking deal in Pennsylvania, would become one of the big sticking points. I'm not going to dive too terribly far into this right now. Simply because where we paused our story, we have really yet to see the most significant consequences from the French and Indian War for the Native American tribes. In fact, our next narrative episode of the show, right after the Q&A episode, is going to be looking specifically at that question. One of the common themes throughout the podcast so far has been the colonial treatment of the Native Americans and how that would act as a major driver of the relationship between the colonists and the crown. Of course, 
tensions between the Crown and the colonists existed pretty much right from the beginning. In Virginia, things do get off to a better start, considering that the expedition was largely made up of fortune seekers. However, up to the north in Plymouth, you have the Pilgrims, who had actual gripes with the leadership back in London. During the 1630s, you see that massive influx of Puritans from England crossing the Atlantic to escape persecution under William Laud and Charles I. This brings us to one of those very key moments that is going to help explain so much of what is going to come through the rest of the century. The Massachusetts Bay Colony proprietors managed to obtain a charter that failed to state where the headquarters must be located. This allowed the headquarters of the colony to not be in London, but rather in Massachusetts itself. This provided the colony with a level of autonomy that is really going to become problematic for the English as time moved on. This autonomy allowed the Puritans to establish a society that was able to use the church successfully as a gatekeeper into colonial politics. This is not to say that London does not occasionally try to get control over the often recalcitrant colony. However, really what saved Massachusetts and all of New England for so long was the fact that over and over they would be saved by external events. The English would raise their eyebrows following the Pequot War. However, little came from it. During the 1660s, there was the persecution of the Quakers, mixed with Charles II trying to ensure that the New England colonies were still loyal to him. The Puritans made some temporary changes, and once satisfied that they paid the appropriate amount of lip service, they went ahead and went right back to their old actions. By the 1670s, the English were pretty fed up with Massachusetts, and were making plans to re-establish royal prerogative in the colony. Here is where Indian affairs would come in, as King Philip's War would jam up the English. King Philip's War would basically derail any attempts of the English to intervene in Massachusetts. Massachusetts at this time was offered help from the New York governor and future New England supervillain Edmund Andros. However, the colonists in Connecticut informed Andros and his men, at the end of their muskets, that they really did not need his help. At the end of the war, the English were absolutely concerned about the fact that the New England colonies had just conducted a war where they did not use any help from England. Again, intervention became the topic of the day. However, before that goes anywhere, the Popish plot and the resulting exclusion crisis would derail everything. Finally, with royal prerogative reeling from years of challenges, the Crown could no longer afford to allow Massachusetts, and indeed all of the New England colonies, to continue acting with this level of autonomy. The resulting Dominion of New England, led by the previously mentioned Andros, would infuriate the New England colonists. Part of the problem is that through Andros's policies, it really brought up that question of the rights of the American colonists as Englishmen. Andros would disband the assembly. He would, in their minds, infringe on their religious rights by supporting the Anglican Church. He would nullify hundreds of land grants. In the aftermath of James II's fall from power in the Glorious Revolution, the colonists in Boston wasted zero time in getting rid of Andros, as an angry mob quickly moved to overthrow him. Boston would not be alone in the 1689 rebellion either. In New York, Jacob Leisler would lead a rebellion, while well, further south in Maryland, they sought to overthrow the Catholic Lord Baltimore. So, if you are counting, which, yeah, we are, this means that between 1676 and 1690, the Dominion of New England, Maryland, Virginia, and New York would all overthrow their English-led governments. We see during the trial of Edmund Andros that really, Despite how they attempted to portray things, William III did not consider the American colonies to be the equals of Englishmen back at home. Well, the idea that they had shed their natural rights when they had immigrated to North America was completely anathema to the beliefs of the American colonists. 
William III did not view them as having those same rights. Pragmatic concerns surrounding their settlement had meant that certain rights that they would have enjoyed back in England itself simply were incompatible with their immigration. While these events had indeed marked the effective end of Puritan hegemony, it also does not end up ushering in a prolonged period of greater imperial control over the colonies. Beginning in the 1720s, the colonies would enter a period of salutary neglect. Under this system, it was decided that a lighter touch would allow the colonial economies to grow. Sure, the colonists were going to cook the books up. However, the belief is that the savings from the looser regulations, combined with the economic growth, would make up the difference from the colonists patting their own purses a bit. This did indeed work. We see in those decades between the end of Queen Anne's War and the French and Indian War, a dramatic growth of the colonial economy. During the early part of the French and Indian War itself, we do see that relationship sour between the British and the colonists at first. But by the end of the war, it had improved some. Absolutely nobody loved Edward Braddock. But his time in charge was short. Both Braddock and Loudon were seriously annoyed by the colonial legislatures, who pretty much refused to do anything to help the war effort. Both men were apoplectic that the colonial assemblies did not just do what they said. Of course, the British commanders would repay the favor by continually ignoring and outright disrespecting the colonists. Recall Braddock's statement to Benjamin Franklin that Indians might be a problem for the provincials, but certainly not for well-trained British regulars. Braddock likewise did a tremendous amount of damage to Indian relationships when he pretty much just universally blows them off as being necessary. This is, of course, right before Braddock and many of his men were ambushed and killed along the shores of the Monongahela River. Despite these early struggles, when William Pitt came into power, the course of the war really would change. Rather than just ordering the colonists around, Pitt decided to treat the American colonists the same as he treated their German allies. This would lead to a lucrative subsidy program, which would pump huge amounts of money into the colonies. And really, by the end of the war, the relationship between the British and the American colonists was at something of a high watermark. The colonists had been pretty pumped up years before when they had captured Louisbourg. Now, however, the entire French presence in Canada had been run out of town. The American economy was booming under Pitt's subsidies. It was a high moment for the colonists, who, in their minds, had just taken on a large role in securing a huge victory for the mother country. It would have been completely unfathomable, going into the 1760s, that the American colonies would declare independence just 16 short years later. Nobody knew in 1760 that they were approaching a precipice that would completely change everything. In fact, in 1760, things seemed better than they had really ever been before. However, as we are going to see, things can and will indeed change quickly. Really, though, the colonial story was not one of universally close relations between the crown and her colonies. The relationship between the colonies and London had often been filled with strife. A large number of people came into the colonies specifically because they wanted to get out of England. Even in places like Virginia, where things were seemingly better than in Massachusetts, they were not exactly that much more excited for British intervention. At the best of times, the colonies just wanted to be left alone. They absolutely did not want more British interference. During those years of salutary neglect, the colonists were able to show just how much economic development they were able to have without the British breathing down their necks. Of course, this growth was not good for everybody. The frontiers had been pushed out everywhere. From Maine all the way down through Georgia, the British dominated the Atlantic coast of North America. Following the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, the British controlled everything from Canada down through the former Spanish holdings in Florida. It was without question the height of British power and projection in North America. This is going to create an entirely new era of tension with Indian tribes 
something that we're going to lead off with next season. It is also impossible to tell this story without recognizing that by the time 1760 rolled around, slavery had become a critical part of the American colonial economy. By 1710, slavery had become more valuable than even the land in the southern colonies. Beyond the value of the slave trade on its surface, however, slavery had finally forced the southern colonies to diversify their economies. As farming modernized, yields became larger and income increased. This wide-scale diversification of the colonial economy, largely one that rode on the backs of the slave trade, would be a transformative event for the colonies in that first half of the 18th century and beyond. The rise of slavery would likewise transform the future United States in other ways as well. Beyond the very obvious moral problems, we see as early as the 1600s and then really in the 1700s, two distinct economies begin to emerge. By the time we are at the 1760s, there absolutely was a southern and a northern economic structure. There was, of course, significant overlap between the two. However, already we see a setup where slavery will play a very major role in politics moving forward. By the time we reach the end of the French and Indian War, it is possible to look forward and see many of the trends that are going to end up dominating the early United States. Much of what we are going to see heading into the turbulent 1760s are events that have been 150 years in the making. All of these things, from the motivation of the first colonists coming to North America, the wars and strifes of the final quarter of the 17th century, salutary neglect leading to the massive expansion of both the population and the economy, Indian affairs, slavery, warfare, and questions about the rights of Englishmen that have been lingering the entire time are going to inform and drive the events of the coming decades. Even now, as we reach the official run-up to the revolution, we are going to continually be looking back, bringing up those events from decades past, and looking at how they relate to the coming imperial crisis. Because, really, it all does matter. This is the world that the founding generation grew up in. Time isn't so long that they did not know the stories of their past. George Washington's great-grandfather was a part of Bacon's Rebellion. Benjamin Franklin and Washington himself have been in our story for a while now. So many of the people that we have discussed during our French and Indian War series are going to be appearing in our story again as we move forward. The point is, many of these events were not the distant past to the founding generation. They had heard the stories, often firsthand. The political landscape that helped form their thoughts, beliefs, and experiences were formed by the events that we have been talking about for these past 108 episodes. And of course... Nothing about what I have done here today has been intended to be comprehensive. I have been researching and writing for this podcast since October 2017. Today is our 108th episode. There is zero chance that I can give anything resembling a comprehensive summary of all that we have done in a single episode. Rather today, I hope that I was able to pull some of those most critical strings together for you all. As we stand, prepared to embark on a new era, where the world really is going to be turned upside down, I want to be sure that we are prepared to continue to reach back to these earlier times and look at how they are going to affect everything moving forward. Next time, we are going to return to our question and answer episode. I got a lot of great questions, and I've selected a handful of them, and I've been working hard to get you all some good answers. I want to take a moment to end today and seriously thank all of you for taking the time to listen. That I've got people willing to listen to me talk about a subject which I really do love. Well, that's pretty great. I really do appreciate all the support, and I look forward to continuing on with this into the future. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope that you are staying healthy and that you are staying safe. And I will see you all back here next time as I answer your questions.